Chapter 4 Buried Deep They set off early the next morning. Before the sun had broken the horizon, the faint glow of its coming light cutting through the clouds and turning the world into a bright grey. Twiglet was up before the others, as always. She went first to the stables and picked out MacIver's horse and two ponies, and then led them to the courtyard where she saddled them and prepared them for the journey ahead. She did not have to wait long for Hobnob and MacIver to join her. Together, they rode out of the department building, out past the great stone walls and towards the long brown practice fields. There were young apprentices out there now, half naked, covered in red welts and sores, their bare arms shaking in the cold, the harsh voices of their drill masters cutting through the air, forcing them to repeat reloading drills over and over. One of the trainees would raise a gun to his eye and pretend to fire, for real cartridges were too precious to waste. He would then eject the gun while his companion loaded the next rounds for him. Then they would swap and do it again. The air was filled with the sounds of snapping guns and practice cartridges clattering across the ground. Twiglet watched with a strangely nostalgic eye. She knew from experience that the cold like this would make fingers slow and numb. More than one trainee would accidentally clamp the gun shut too quickly, or his partner would not pull back fast enough, and then… well… She still remembered the pain and bleeding of her fingers. She had been lucky not to lose them, but that was the way things were with the ram guard. You were to be the bulwark against the wolf. Sacrificing your body was part of the deal. She wondered how she could miss the training, and yet be glad to be free of it at the same time. The endless fight and reaction training drills that left bruises and wounds that plagued you for weeks. The shooting drills, where you would spend hours at the crossbows, hitting targets till your fingers bled. And of course, the will testing. Hours of mind-numbing concentration exercises until your brain turned to putty. It had been agony, yes, but at least it had felt like progression. One day, each of those young apprentices, or the ones that survived at least, would graduate to her level and earn their woolen coat and shotgun. They would take the next step to serve a patron. Serving your patron was meant to be a noble and glorious thing, a chance to learn from a true ram guard hardened in the field, but Twiglet felt it strangely like she was throwing her life away. Magnus MacIver had lost more apprentices than any other patron in company history. Or, so they said. After only a few months as his apprentice, she no longer doubted these rumours. This step up was more like a death sentence than anything else. Well, at least she was serving the faith, she told herself firmly, putting things right. It was okay to give up your life for something bigger. This world needed people like that people willing to give themselves up for something larger than themselves. That thought cheered her a little, but still left a sour taste in her mouth. The whole thing might be a lot easier, she supposed, if MacIver wasn't such a prick. They went past the last of the training grounds and reached the secondary wall. This one was much shorter and uglier than the other, and heavily marked with deep grooves, some of them bullet holes and blade scratches, and others looked more like claw marks, or something worse. They nodded to the sour-faced guards who pulled open the gates, revealing the world beyond. A thick canopy of trees greeted them, separated from the wall by a long line of cut trunks. The only clear area was the road ahead. It cut through the forest like the wake of a great ship through water. They urged their mounts on together, through the gates, which grated shut behind them, and out into the wild. And then they were on their way, the only company being each other, and the echoing sounds of the forest around them. The going was slow, and they had to keep a keen eye out. Roads were not safe these days. Troops of the traitor king raided all over the land, paid mercenaries and trained soldiers alike, bringing chaos in their wake. Then, of course, there were the bandits and highwaymen, the petty kings and heretical lords who had turned deserter after blood barley. You never knew where you stood with men like that. Men with little to lose were always much more dangerous than other men. 
They were, however, the lesser of dangers. The Wild King had returned with the mist and unleashed dark things into the night, things that even the bravest of Ramgard would be wise to fear. Twisted mistlings, unlike anything before conjured from human sin. That was why the Ramgard were so utterly vital. They were the last bulwark against the darkness. Despite her usually iron resolve, after several hours into the journey, Twiglet found her mind drifting elsewhere. The saddle was uncomfortable, and her butt was hurting desperately now, sending stab after stab up her spine with every lurch of the pony. She was good at a lot of things, she supposed. Fighting, shooting, will-bindings, and memorising, but riding was not one of them. Horses and ponies seemed extremely nervous around Twiglet, and she around them. When riding, she and the animal held a mutual distrust of one another, and all parties involved were very relieved when the saddle came off at the end of the day. MacIver never ceased to notice her discomfort, however, and it seemed to irritate him. Every time her pony disobeyed her, he would state that the beast need to be mastered and beaten into submission. How could anything respect and obey you, he said, unless it knew what you were capable of? His fingers did not shy away from the whip, and rumour had it he had lost almost as many horses as he had apprentices. Twiglet did not take his advice. It sickened her. As much as she disliked the pony, the thought of whipping it was out of the question. That was yet another of MacIver's golden wisdoms that she chose to ignore. She looked up at the big man now, his large shire horse struggling along under his prestigious weight. He was a huge man, both physically and mentally, and yet there was a weakness to him too. She often saw the pressings of his paunch beginning to show at his belt, and she had lost track of how many times she had caught him carefully, silently devouring a wrapped chocolate or delicacy when he thought no one was looking. This strange contradiction in him also showed in his teaching methods. He would seem fatherly on occasion, mentoring and forgiving with a nurturing eye, Yet on a dime he could switch to cold and unfeeling wrath as he doled out just punishment. He seemed to have no qualms whatsoever about guiding young people to their deaths. Twiglet loathed him, almost about as much as she admired him, almost about as much as she loathed the name that she had been given. It was a stupid, condescending name, but the old bastard insisted on it. She glared at his back as another bump of pain shot up her spine. She only had to last another few months, just till the end of the year. Then she could move on to her own placement and her own missions. Only a few months and she could go back to calling herself Twiglet! MacIver roared, turning and waving a huge beckoning hand to her. She sighed. It was as if the man demanded domination over her thoughts as well as her actions. She could never get a moment's peace. Like the good little apprentice she was, she dug her heels into her pony and urged it on. As the pony kicked into a trot, Twiglet felt a surge of nervousness overtake her, which she had to fight to keep off her face as she drew level with the others. Hobnob seemed to notice, though, and smirked as she approached. She paid him no mind. Her fellow apprentice was even more of a pig than the old man. She growled a curse under her breath before she could stop herself. Hmm? said MacIver, looking at her and smiling a smug sort of smile. Uh, nothing, sir, Twiglet said firmly. Just saying that we're off to a good start. Yes, well, said MacIver slowly. If the weather keeps up and we don't run into any trouble on the road, then uh, we should make it there by nightfall tomorrow. He said any trouble, as if the prospect excited him. Very good, sir, said Twiglet. You called? Ah, yes, MacIver said, as if he had suddenly remembered, looking over at Hobnob disapprovingly. Apprentice Hobnob here was just inquiring as to the attributes of a vice mistling, as he has clearly not spent nearly enough time in the Lamentations and Odes libraries. I was wondering if you might fill him in, get it into his thick head of his, if you can. Of course, sir. She rose a mocking eyebrow at Hobnob. The boy was a Ramgard apprentice of a year now, and he didn't know the first thing about misklings. What a joke. He glared back at her murderously, but she ignored him, 
She knew just how to push his buttons and saw no reason not to. After all, did he not do the same thing to her? Vice Misslings, she began, with only an edge of pride to her voice, play off the wants and desires of their victims, using them to enhance their forms. According to the battle hymn of Ben Tidy, the vices take many forms depending on the type of desire or weakness that they intend to exploit. Because of this, they are far easier to spot than some other mislings, taking on more monstrous appearances. In one of his odes, Ramgar Tidy noted the capturing and execution of an adultery vice that was plaguing the town of Letterkenny. He states that the mistling was startlingly attractive and was using her good looks to disrupt the peace by attracting married men in and then refusing their advances. This, however, seems like a possibly questionable source, as Ramgar Tidy himself admits a deep level of attraction to the supposed mistling. His diaries also suggest that she had refused his advances. There is a possibility that he was unable to control his growing feelings for her and after rejection took it to be some sort of charm or spell. Well, better to be safe than sorry, I always say, grunted MacIver, then urged Twiglet to continue. A better source would be in the same hymn, but in the passage written by Ramgard Higgins. He documents Tidy's death several weeks later at the hands of a rage vice that had ripped the Ramgard in two before fleeing into the night. Higgins seemed to note that the vice fed on the motions of the mortals around it, becoming stronger as those around it succumbed to their own rage. Tidy's contained rage and fighting spirit only fueled the creature to better become more powerful and eventually kill him. Very good, Twiglet. He smiled at her and reached into his coat before pulling out a crumbling biscuit, which he pressed into her hand. She stared at it, paralysed, some part of her mind knowing that MacIver genuinely thought he was being genial. For a second, she considered dropping it or crushing it between her fingers, but she couldn't bring herself to it. Dutifully, she slipped it into her pocket. MacIver smiled brightly and turned back to the road. After a short silence, Hobnob muttered disgruntledly to himself and said, I don't see how that helps, none. It helps, said MacIver, because if you don't understand your enemy, then how are you meant to defeat it? In the case of a vice, it is to control your emotions. Mistlings are all about the details. If you don't pay attention to these details, then you will soon find yourself quite quickly out of your depth. He began to chuckle to himself heartily, as if he had just thought of something hilariously funny and was struggling to get it out. <laughs> or find yourself rather spread out. <laughs> All over the place, I mean. Like Ramgard Tidy. He snorted to himself happily. Neither of the other apprentices laughed. Twiglet, because she didn't find it funny, and Hobnob, because he didn't get the joke. MacIver's laugh trailed off with a sigh, and he continued... Ah, what I'm saying is, Hobnob, you should try to pay attention to things like this. This knowledge will save your life one day. Learn a little from our wee Miss Twiglet over here, and you'll find yourself having a long and prosperous career. You need more than muscles in our employment. When it comes to mistlings, sometimes you'll find your muscles turn out to be as effective as chocolate toilet paper. Hobnob's eyes narrowed at this chastisement, and he turned to look back at Twiglet, his eyes filling with malice. Aye, but brains and all that, it's good, right, but it's not good for nothing unless you don't pull the trigger. Ain't that right, Twig? Twiglet felt her face grow suddenly hot. She turned to glare at Hobnob, her jaw tightened and her hand curled around into a fist. MacIver let out a happy grunt, unaware of the tension brewing in the air. Indeed, that is a very good point, Hobnob. Ah, the truth of it is that it all does come to nothing if you canny pull the trigger. A ramguard is many parts combined to make a killing device. We are like a, a rifle or a shotgun. It needs a barrel, a stock, a trigger, a sights, an ammo. So it is with us. The brains are necessary, as is the physical fitness and the strength of will on the piety. Once they all come together, the trigger is the thing that does the killing, and it must be pulled. He gestured firmly on the last words, chopping his hand through the air like a butcher's knife. 
He looked from apprentice to apprentice and grinned happily. See, he said, you are both currently but one part of the gun. You have a lot to learn from one another, don't you? And you will. I indeed. This is part of what makes us stronger than them. We learn from one another. We work as a unit. And with vicious and steadfast action, we overcome everything on our way. Eh? He sighed contentedly and rubbed at his moustache. So, from now on, Twiglet, you will teach Hobnob a little bit more about things that we are hunting. And in return, Hobnob, you will teach Twiglet how to go about actually finishing your assignments properly and pulling the trigger too. How does that sound? He grinned brighter, no doubt feeling incredibly proud at his own teaching abilities. The two of them were silent for a while before Hobnob spoke up. He certainly looked a lot happier with this situation than Twiglet did. And how will I do that, sir? Toughen up the twig, I mean. Oh, hmm. I don't know. Uh, perhaps catch a rabbit or some other animal and make her cut its throat or something. Get her to familiarise herself with death more. Come on, boy, you've got an imagination. Use it. I can just tell by the end of this trip, you will be recounting the odes. And Twiggy here, well... He reached out and patted Twiglet on the shoulder, who kept her eyes fixed on the pony's back. Well, she'll be the most ruthless killing machine the Order's ever trained. McIver looked from one of them to the other, grinning like an idiot. Happy? They both nodded, Twiglet slower to do so by far, and hating herself as she did. Brilliant! McIver bellowed. Now let's keep moving. Sun slows for no man, not even the Prophet. Twiglet's coat was caked in blood. The creature had squirmed and screeched as her knife had slid home. She had had to saw half its damn head off to get it to stop kicking. It had been the definition of a botched job. From across the fire, Hobnob was sneering at her triumphantly, grease dripping down his chin from the rabbit leg he was chewing on. She glared back at him, but said nothing. The half-eaten rabbit on her plate was growing cold in the cool air. She couldn't look at it anymore, so she put it to one side and set about cleaning her coat of some of the blood that had gotten onto the white wool interior. She began to scrub at it, using a little water from her flask, dribbling it onto a cloth and teasing it out of the wool, but it was not coming out. After working at it for a whole twenty minutes, she finally gave up and put it to the side. When she did, she looked up and saw that McIver was deep in thought his face illuminated by the small fire, his thick muscular hands entwined over his lap. To his left, Hobnob was sprawled in the grass, squinting over at the misty area that the old man must have given him. McIver's eyes were distant, and it was clear that whatever thought was in his mind, it troubled him greatly. Despite this, she decided that this was the best time to ask. When else would she get another opportunity like this? They had not intended to take this break, but the weariness of the night's ride had overtaken the two apprentices, and McIver had agreed for a short break and nap. Sir. McIver stirred slightly, but his eyes did not leave the fire. Yes, apprentice Twiglet? She paused, not entirely sure how to continue. You said the churchman we're going to help is called Cole. That's right, McIver said, his eyes turning to look at her, twinkling curiously. It's just... Twiglet knew this could go wrong, but she couldn't let herself leave it be. I think... I think I've seen that name before. Oh, McIver said, his eyebrows rising. In an ode? McIver did not respond. Next to yours. There was a long silence at that. The old man regarding her with an emotion that she didn't recognise... A second of fear blossomed in her heart. You are referring to the Battle of Donegal Castle, are you not? The blood on her coat, readily forgotten. All questions were on her lips now, and she didn't know which to ask first. Did you really? I, McIver said, but his voice had gone cold, bereft of all emotion, and Twiglet felt her heart drop. Twiglet, I would advise you to be more careful. Many of the odes are hidden for a good reason, and rightly so. The one you speak of, like the others, has been embellished. 
But yes, the majority of it is true. After a long pause, he followed that with, In that moment, it changed us in ways that others can only dream of. We were meant to be there, Twiglet. We were meant to be at that moment and witness what happened. His voice had taken on a distant quality, and even now Hobnob was staring at him, her mouth wide open. I remember the blood and the fire, the gold masks, the silver ones, the bronze ones, the oaths, the shots, the gunpowder. We were in the centre of it when it happened. I know now that no other Ramguard would have responded the way I did, as quickly as I did, and as decisively. And there is no other churchman than Cole who would have had the insight to see it coming before it did. Twiglet realised her mouth had gone dry. Was that fear she felt? Or had the need to know completely overridden all else? Why? she asked before she could stop herself. McIver's fingers twitched as she said it, and immediately she regretted it. His eyes narrowed and he moved to stand. She shied back, unsure of what to do. The excitement was gone, replaced with cold, real fear. The ram captain could easily break her on his knee like a hound's spine beneath a car wheel. He paused and his voice came out in a low, hollow deadpan. You are a clever girl, Twiglet. Stay that way. Don't repeat history. You understand? Yeah, yes, she said quietly. Yes, sir. McIver nodded and turned away from her. Twiglet felt the fear wash away like a cold bath, disappointment flooding in to fill its space. Bloody fool she was bringing that up the way she had. Stupid, stupid girl. She was better than that. That was the sort of question he would have asked, not her. The thought of him twisted her gut into a knot as it always did, and always she fought back against that feeling. He had been weak, and she needed to be stronger. MacIver stamped out the fire and pulled the binding cross from his wide neck. It was a simple iron cross, with the mask of the prophet carved into the front of it, golden swirls painted over it in dizzying patterns. He drew the shotgun from its sheath on its saddle and took two cartridges from his pack. Gently, and with great care, he wrapped the cross around the gun and laid it on the ground before him, then knelt before it, cartridges in hand. Twiglet and Hobnob watched him do this and at once sprang to their feet to copy him. He waited in silence, eyes closed and breathing slow, till they too lay down their guns and knelt to either side of him. Then he spoke. O oh, prophet of the shining gun and calling blade, we entreat you now to firm our wills for the fight ahead. The two apprentices repeated his words, lowering their heads. First I offer to you this cartridge, O shining one. Let me pull the trigger and watch the wolf fall to my iron, salt and hawthorn. This I pray. As he said this, he took up the gun and opened it, slotting in a single cartridge. Twiglet and Hobnob copied him and repeated the prayer. Second, I offer another cartridge, other than the first. This one I offer in the fear that my mind will fall to the lie of undestiny. Should I falter with my first, then I beg of you, guide my faith with the second. Draw the shot from my barrel and smite the wolf most justly this I pray. MacIver slotted in the second and closed his gun. The cool midday air filled with the sound of metallic snapping. Thirdly, MacIver said, uncoiling the cross from his gun and pulling it back over his head. I offer up to you, O glorious one, my hand, my head, my heart and my body. I put my faith and flesh in your mighty hands, that you might guide me down to bear down on the wolf and rip open its flesh. With this, I pray in your name. 
The prayer rang out from each of their lips, and Twiglet felt a great ease of pressure as the cold chain touched her neck. She pressed her cross and added a fourth prayer to the other three, but this one in secret. O oh, prophet, destroyer of sinners, take his death as payment for my own. This I pray. The words were knotting up her guts again as the group clambered up onto their mounts and set out on the road once more. It was late evening by the time they saw the town rising up in the distance. The rapid overgrowth of the wilderness had torn up some of the roads and made the going far harder than they had expected, but it had begun to become more ordered and clear the closer they got. Finally, they had spotted the church spire over the tops of the trees and emerged onto a long road with lumpy fields on either side and a knobbly wooden barricade in the distance. As they grew closer, MacIver pulled free his shotgun from his saddle holster and laid it across his lap. Twiglet did the same. Remember, MacIver said coolly, all fatherly warmth gone from his voice. We are ready for everything. We have no idea what state this town is in. For all we know, they could have been affected by a dreamer, or overtaken by heretic forces. Or something worse. Trust no one, and keep your finger on your trigger. They nodded and rode on in silence, passing a faded sign for a golf course, the brambles overgrown it and dragging it down to the earth like a kraken pulling down a ship. Past this, the first houses began to draw close, and Twiglet could see people tilling the earth around the town. They used sharp axes to chop away at the brambles and roots so that the ploughs could move in and churn up the earth. Young children followed after, planting seeds and watering them. The people looked like they were preparing to finish their work for the day. Some of them looked up as they passed, but when they saw the thick woolen coats and the shotguns, they at once averted their gaze turning back to their work or hurrying their children out of sight. MacIver smiled down at them cheerily, but the smile never reached his eyes, and his hand never left his gun. They drew close to the barricade and noticed that it was of sturdy design. These folk were used to attacks at the least. To the left of it was a large white building, with several tents outside it in the place where the car park had used to be. At that moment, a man heard the sound of approaching hooves on the tarmac and clambered out of the nearest tent. He was dressed in a ragged green uniform with an ugly, unreadable symbol sewn into the arm. He looked rather bedraggled, with wild, unkempt white hair and squinting, tired eyes that didn't seem to take in much. Oi! he hollered angrily, scrambling to pick up a makeshift spear made from a kitchen knife and a broom handle. Who in the hell's name are you? Captain McIver, friend, what say you to opening these gates for us now? The old man looked puzzled at that. Captain? We don't get no captains here. Captain of where, exactly? What do you think you're doing here? There ain't nobody allowed in the town after dark, you should know that. The guard had not seemed to recognise them. The sun was behind them at this point, and he squinted up at them like a man with troubled eyesight. Twiglet glanced at MacIver nervously, watching his hand tighten on his gun. MacIver smiled brightly and said, But the sun isn't down yet, is it? He gestured behind him to the setting blaze of orange. The guard glanced there but shook his head. Ah, that'll be gone in a few seconds. Besides, I don't trust no man on a horse nor a pony. This captain speak is nonsense. Sounds like mistling mischief if you ask me. Now turn off and bugger off before I have to get some of the others and we fill you with holes. MacIver didn't move, and Twiglet noticed that he had grown very still. His grin still twisted across his face, masking his fury. The guard poked at him with his spear. Didn't you hear me? He growled and took a step forward, his reedy arm shaking under the weight of his spear, an unconvincing threat. He was not prepared for what happened next. One of MacIver's large hands reached out and plucked the spear from the man's hand. He stumbled forwards, his eyes going wide with shock. MacIver then swung the spear up and down in one fluid movement, like a polo player taking a swing. The wooden haft of it crunched against the guard's head and snapped with a deafening crack. The old man let out a yelp of pain and stumbled backwards, tripping over the pavement and collapsing onto the ground. 
His hands were on his head and blood was pouring through his fingers. MacGyver casually dismounted and towered over him, the broken halves of the spear still in his hand. Twiglet felt sure then that he was about to hit the man again, and she wasn't sure if he would ever stop hitting him. What in the bleeding hells? came a voice from another tent. Another half-dressed guard had scrambled out and stood frozen at the scene before him. His eyes went wide as he took in the woolen coats and shotguns, and then he looked to his bleeding companion. He put up his hands and made no move to help the fallen guard. Uh, terribly sorry about that, sirs. And marm. He, he didn't see you so well. He's, he's got a bit of a problem with his eyes. He, he just must have thought you were strangers and all. Quick as a flash, the murderous look left MacIver's eyes. He tutted loudly and spun the broken spear pieces in his hands. They looked so small in those hands, like wood chips. He tossed one of them to the second guard, who managed to catch one of them and then lower his eyes fearfully. Obnob, MacIver shouted, and his apprentice drew near. You will stay here and find the marchmaster of this town. Make sure he is aware of the poor quality of his troops, and that I may have broken one after some serious insubordination. Then he is to sit and await my summons. If he makes any move to leave your sight, do not hesitate to put him down. Yes, Ram Captain, Hobnob said, dismounting and making his way towards the large white building. Oh, and Hobnob, MacIver called out. The apprentice turned and MacIver smiled at him pleasantly. I advise you to switch to normal cartridges. They will be much cheaper in killing humans should it be required. Hobnob nodded as MacIver turned to the remaining guard. No, he said happily. If you wouldn't mind opening the gate, I have a need to get to the church. And don't worry, I know the way. Bogman awoke to pain, silence, and darkness. The shards of the dream he had just experienced dancing from his grip mockingly. His head throbbed painfully, making him feel sick and converting the world around him into a blurry mess. The mistling had hit with punches like a sledgehammer blow to the face, and Bogman wondered if he'd be lucky enough not to have a concussion. At once, he knew that was not the case, as he stood and felt the world pitch and sway around him. He almost fell back to the ground, but his hand caught a surviving table, and he managed to hold himself up. The room continued to swing around him sickeningly. He had never been to sea, but he had the impression it might be something like this. There was something he was missing, something he was forgetting. What was wrong with him? Perhaps Cole knew. Cole. The second he heard that name, it sent a jolt of fear through him. He pushed up from the table and was relieved to find that he did not fall over. Staring around the room, he saw that he was alone. He hadn't been alone before, had he? There had been someone with him, someone he was protecting... Looking after? Yes. There'd been Mickey here. The mistling had been advancing on him, and Maisie, too. She was in a deep sleep. Well, wherever they were, the two of them were nowhere in sight now. He looked to the door and saw that it was a shattered gash, the wind gently rocking the remnants of the wood clinging to the hinges and making the whole pub creak. The mistling had destroyed it as he fled. Bogman stepped towards it and then stopped, the shards of his dream were now sliding neatly into place in his mind, like a betrayer's knife. He had been locked in a room, a terrible hunger gripping him with iron fingers, though he had not been himself. Bogman ran, making for the door, but stumbling shoulder first into the wall instead. He rebounded and almost collapsed to the ground, his shoulder aching. Clutching it, he pushed himself around the wall and staggered outside. It was dark now, probably just after sundown. The workers would be coming back from the fields any moment now. They would head straight for their bar and find it utterly destroyed. Bogman wanted to run, but the pounding in his skull felt like a thundering punch with each beat. He tried to orient himself, but found he was barely able to walk in a straight line. It felt like his body belonged to a drunk man. The church. He had to get to the church. He realized he had fallen against something, and he pushed up from cold stone. Looking up, he saw that he was beneath the old statue that the beggar had rested under. It was a weather-beaten old thing, face chipped away by some sharp tool. It seemed to loom over him, the world swaying around it, making it look like it might tip over and crush him in any minute. He growled and pushed away from it, his feet feeling somewhat steadier now. He did not have time to waste. He had to get to Cole. Now. 
He was breathless and muddy from falling so many times by the time he made it to the church. The dizziness had faded somewhat, but still came on in sudden, nauseating waves that made him stumble onto his knees. He was so thirsty. He longed to stop and drink, the thought of cool water making his headache pound all the harder. He pushed through the church doors, not wondering why they were already open, too busy with his haste. Nor did he notice the muddy footprints on the stone, or the scent of horse and gun oil in the air. Bogman made it to the far side of the church, stumbling past the wolf altar. He must have hit it as he passed, for it toppled to the ground with an echoing clatter. Then he was through the door on the other side, and standing before his bedroom door, his hand reaching for the lock. But as his weight pressed against it, the door slid open without protest. It was the stench that hit him first, and he gagged. It was worse than when he had found coal in the morning. Far worse. The room was full of flies, and the smell of blood was overwhelming. He entered slowly, and what he saw made him fall to his knees. There was not much left of the churchman. Not much to be recognised, that is. The thing that was lying there had no cheeks or lips whatsoever. They had been chewed away, leaving a gaping open jaw. What teeth remained there were red-tinged and stringy with chunks of flesh. Bogman could see the white bone of his exposed jaw, and it was startlingly white. His hands, too, had been partially devoured. All that remained of Cole's spidery, veiny fingers was a bloody mass on the end of each of his wrists. It seemed that the man had managed to eat most of his own hands before the blood loss had taken him. That blood now pooled around him in a great red mirror. It almost looked, then, like some grand painting, the kind of thing you would see in a church, an old one, an image of hell that awaited the unjust. But there were no demons here, or angels either, no watching cherubim or winged host, nor were there devils or flashing flame. Just an empty room, and the man that had been the closest thing that Bogman had had to a father. He had locked him in here to prevent him from eating himself to death, and instead, the churchman had literally eaten himself to death. Cole had consumed his own flesh, rather than face the hunger within him. Bogman stared at his glassy eyes, his head pounding with his slow heartbeat. A fly landed on what remained of Cole's tongue, a black dot on the bloody red blob. I'm so sorry, Cole, Bogman gasped, and he realised he was crying. I'm so sorry. I tried. I really tried. I fucked up. I... Well, now... That's one hell of a mess, ain't it? Bogman whirled around. A man was standing in the doorway behind him. A thick-chested and wide-bellied giant with a moustache and twinkling eyes. He rested a shotgun on one shoulder and smiled down at Bogman in a manner that wasn't entirely unfamiliar. What? Who are... Bogman began to say, his voice ragged and dry. He did not get a chance to finish. Before he could, the shotgun had swung effortlessly from the man's shoulder and pointed between Bogman's eyes. There was a moment of silence as Bogman stared down the barrels. The man grinned at him, a line of yellowish teeth under his grey moustache. When he spoke, his voice was cool and calmly mocking. Well, hello there, Bogman. My name is Captain McIver. At that point, from behind the captain stepped a small figure, she was short, with dark, frizzy hair that surrounded her head like a huge, dark halo. Twiglet, this is the mistling we are looking for. Take it into custody for the murder of Churchman Cole. What? Wait, what? What the hell are you talking about? Bogman asked dumbly. Then she was upon him, pulling his arms behind his back, and burning iron was singeing his wrists. He made out to yelp in pain and struggle, though his arms were weak, and it was no use. He was already exhausted, and the touch of the iron seemed to draw what strength he had left. The small girl hauled him upwards with surprising strength, and as he was pulled up and away, Bogman found himself fixated on the ragged remains of the churchman. His own eyes stared into Cole's unblinking ones. I didn't do this, he said quietly, and his eyes met the captain's, and he saw something deep and terrible in those eyes. Of course not. 
It's just in your nature. Twiglet pushed the man onwards, the barrel of his shotgun shoving aggressively into his back to keep him moving. He was a scrawny man, thin but wiry, with wide blue eyes and scruffy hair and beard. He didn't look much like a mistling, at least from what Twiglet read, and she had read a lot. Then again, many mistlings were very hard to identify. If they had been easy, this would have been a very short war indeed. Even saying that, though, there was something she couldn't quite put her finger on about him. An innocence seemed to radiate off him, like a small child or a helpless beaten dog. What's more, his breathing was unnervingly human. One of the few easy ways to identify a mistling was their breathing. It tended to be smooth and steady, like clockwork, never changing with moods. But this man's was ragged and all over the place. He wore a churchman's coat, which Twiglet realised he must have taken from Cole after he killed him. He must have done that when he had fought Cole, for there clearly had been a fight. His face was a mass of bruises, and he was struggling to stand straight for longer than a few moments. She tried to put the timeline into order. He must have fought Cole and beaten him into submission, then stolen the coat, cast his charm in him, and then locked him up to die. Twiglet frowned. It didn't quite fit. The man had been utterly devastated when he had found Cole. It had been like he hadn't been expecting it. But of course, some mistlings were master manipulators, she reasoned. But if he had been guilty, if he truly was the monster who had done that terrible thing to Cole, then why had he come back at all? Why would he have even pretended to act devastated upon finding the body? He had no way of knowing that they were waiting for him. He would have been acting to no one. What's more, the phone call had insinuated that Cole had been taken by surprise, the charm acting immediately. MacIver had pointed it out himself. What had he said? Something about them hearing a struggle over the phone. Perhaps Cole had broken free of the initial charm, and then attacked the mistling, and then they had fought. Then the creature had had to recast the charm. Of course. That was it. That made sense, didn't it? But no. Didn't explain all of it. Why had he come back? Just then, the words of MacIver came back into her mind and reminded her of the dangers of asking too many questions. This could be the mistling's plan all along, slip past her defences with confusion and allow some of her guilts or sins to drift to the forefront of her mind, and then he could use them against her, shatter her binding and kill her. She tried to harden her mind, but as she did, she saw the mistling had stopped. He was staring at the open door to the befouled kitchen. As he stood there, his eyes wide, a strange emotion playing across his face, he suddenly reminded her of someone. Stop that, she growled, and slammed the butt of her gun into his stomach. The mistling let out a very realistic gasp of breath as he staggered to his knees. Stop what? He croaked and looked back at her with those pleading eyes. But this time she chose to think about something else. She thought back to the scene that had greeted her and MacIver when they had forced open the locked church doors. The whole place full of feces and sick and blood. A holy house of God and the prophet given away to a small piece of hell. And then they had found Cole. Locked in a back room like an animal, left to die, left to the torturous magics that had forced him to eat his own flesh. The fate was a terrible one. Just thinking of it rekindled Twiglet's rage. Her pity for the mistling shriveled up almost at once. She growled and forced the man up, ramming her gun into his back again, but this time much harder. He jerked in pain, but barely made a noise. They came to a set of stairs that led down to the church cellar. She pushed him again and watched as he stumbled into the darkness. Lighting a lantern filled the space with a dim light. It was a dusty stone place, perhaps used for storage or for crypts in the old days. A makeshift cell sat in the centre of the room, a rough-made square of iron bars awkwardly hammered into shape. She opened the door, which screeched in protest, and pushed the man inside, closing and locking it behind him. She then turned on her heel to leave, the lantern swinging its light before her as she made her way for the steps. As she turned, the man let out a noise, and she paused, looking back at him curiously. What? she asked. Please, he said, his voice wavering a little. No, leave me in the dark. She stared at him, quite frozen for a moment. I, I just... 
I don't like the dark. A long silence stretched between them, the flickering light of the lantern playing across Twiglet's features. What kind of man admitted they were afraid of the dark? The two of them stared at one another, and for a moment Twiglet thought she might actually leave the lantern for him. But no. Mercy, lack of resolve, weakness... These were all sins in their own way, or pathways to sins. Twiglet turned and walked for the stairs, lantern still clutched in her hand. Behind her, the golden light of it darted after her, the shadows flowing in to fill its space and enveloping the strange man. All she heard from him was a shuddering exhale. Then she was outside, shutting the door to the cellar. In the main part of the church, MacIver was waiting for her. He had put on a set of glasses that looked tiny on his square face. He sat on one of the pews that he had flipped round to face the other pews behind it. The strength required simply to lift and turn a whole row of pews on your own was quite phenomenal, but MacIver seemed hardly out of breath. He was sitting in an easy-going manner, making notes in a very small black book that looked tiny in his gigantic calloused hands. If he was at all bothered by the horrific death of his supposed friend, he did not show it. In fact, he looked positively cheery, humming tunelessly to himself as he added marks to the little notebook. As Twiglet entered, he did not look up at her, but said, And how is our guest? Locked up, in chains, in the church cell. It's not much to look at, but it will hold him. And did you remember to bind the bars with your will, as well as his chains? Twiglet felt a spasm of irritation at that. It was an exhausting thing to make multiple bindings, but general procedure was to bind both shackles and cell to be safe. She had known this, and would have done the double binding anyway, but had completely forgotten it in the moment. She was not about to admit that to MacIver, though. No, I chose not to make the second binding. I judged the creature to be suitably weak enough that one binding should suffice. MacIver tutted condescendingly. Very well, Miss Twiglet. You are an apprentice now, and very capable of making your own decisions. I must admit, though, I did not take you for one to underestimate your opponent. However, on this occasion, I will leave it in your hands. Of course, you will bear responsibility if he does break free. You understand that, don't you? That worried her for a moment. She looked round at the church slowly, at the claw scratches on the pews and the fallen altar, and the altar kitchen door through which the foul stink still permeated. This was all so real now. She was beyond the books and into the reality behind their words. For a moment, she second-guessed if she had made the right decision, and wondered if she shouldn't go back down and double-bind just to be safe. MacIver would not be impressed with that, though. Making a decision was one thing, but Ramgard were meant to stick with their decisions. Doubt and uncertainty, these were weaknesses against the mist. The Prophet's book was very clear on the importance of certainty. Twiglet refrained from going back down to the cellar, and instead decided that this was a good time to press for some information. I have a question, sir. Of course you do, sighed MacIver. She ignored him and pressed on regardless. In the room back there... You named the mistling. Bogdan, or something like that. Do you know this mistling, sir? MacIver's pen paused for a moment on his notes before continuing. For someone with a startlingly good memory, you are awfully bad at remembering your lessons. Aren't you, Twiglet? Did we not only today talk about what happens when you ask too many questions? But I, I just... Before she could go any further, there came a ruckus from outside. Someone was shouting indignantly at the top of their voice as they were being drawn closer and closer to the door. I'll be speaking to your supervisors about this. Do you have any idea the importance of my position? I'm the march master of this town, Sonny. You'll be lucky to keep your head after this, you ginger prick. Oi! The door swung open, and an enormously fat man was forced in, followed closely by Hobnob, who had his shotgun pressed into the man's prestigious belly. The fat man turned, his watery eyes darting from Twiglet to MacIver and back again. His mouth opened as he tried to make sense of it all. MacIver grinned at him and gestured him forwards. As he did, he muttered to Twiglet under his breath. 
We will talk about this later. His tone switched at once as he spoke to the fat man, his booming voice echoing through the church. Ah, March Master Sully, is it? Sully paused at the sound of MacIver's voice, and it seemed only now that the stink of the room hit him. The ram guard had been in the church for a while now, and had grown accustomed to the smell, but the March Master was not prepared in the least. His face drained of all colour as his eyes bulged from their sockets. With shaking hands, he pulled a handkerchief from his pocket and used it to cover his mouth. His eyes were wide, wet, fearful saucers, darting from the fouled floor to MacIver's dark eyes and back again. MacIver seemed to note where he looked and let out an apologetic sigh. <sighs> oh, yes, well... About all of this, um, I'm afraid your church master has, um, recently uh, expired, so to speak, due to unforeseen circumstances. Oh, oh, don't worry, he added when he saw Sully's expression. The church will, of course, send you a new one to take over his duties in, uh, within a month or so. C call dead? Sully croaked. Aye, yes, that is what expired means. Unforeseen circumstances? Mm hmm, that would be murdered, to be precise. Quite brutally, in fact. A, a, a month? Indeed. It is quite a bother to train them these days, especially in the rate that they die, MacIver said ignoring the Marchmaster's indignation and flipping back a page in his notebook. Frankly, though, that is not really your concern right now. What is much more pressing is the circumstances of the murder of one of the Prophet's own churchmen, a fine and presentable man who is close to the Prophet's heart, I might add. D do you know that he won a silver mask for his bravery at Blood Barley? The gravity of the situation seemed to hit Sully all at once then, and the handkerchief slowly fell from his face. Uh, I didn't know that. Mm, he was quite the impressive fellow, wasn't he? Sadly, though, impressive fellows die just the same as unimpressive ones, don't you think? There was a slight tinge of malice in his final words, but before Sully could judge anything by it, MacIver had quickly moved on. Now, let's see here. You have been Marchmaster in this town for several years, have you not? The Marchmaster didn't answer the question. His eyes had now fixed on the bloody stain on the floor. MacIver let out an exasperated sigh. <sighs> Please, Mr. Sully, let us focus on the matter at hand, if you will. To delay a Ramguard's investigation is a punishable offence. If I were you, I would simply ask your man at the gate as to the consequences of that. Sully gulped. Uh, um, of course, he said, his voice taking on a sudden fawning tone. Uh, I ap apologies, I must, I, I, I'm not feeling myself today. Uh, what, what was the question? Uh, oh, all right, yes, yes, I've been the Marshmaster here for four years. I was pulled in after Marshmaster Jackson was killed off by bandits. He trailed off suddenly, then quickly added, I I'm uh, sorry, I I'm just in a bit of a shock at the moment. Cole has been a close friend to me for so many years, I just can't believe he's gone. Really? Well, that is a surprise to me, MacIver said, turning over one of the pages of his notebook and adjusting his glasses. In the last of Cole's reports, he describes you as... <clears throat> A simpering and greedy, bumbling buffoon, who cares more for his own advancement than for the betterment of church interests. I quote. MacIver cleared his throat ceremoniously. <clears throat> Marchmaster Sully is lucky to have come this far, and I find myself questioning what empty-brained donkey ever promoted him from the ranks. His sins are numerous and very distasteful, as is his complete lack of will or constraint. 
I ask again that he be removed from my town and replaced with someone of more competency. He glanced over his glasses at Sully. Forgive me, but that doesn't sound like friendship to me. Sully's eyes bulged, and he looked for a moment like anger might overtake him, but then fear overtook that instead. He coughed and righted himself. Ah, uh, well, we did have uh, disagreements over things, but you must understand I respected him deeply, and I would never, ever... His tone was becoming pleading now, and his thick hands gestured to the blood and the sick. MacGyver looked confused then, and his eyebrows rose as he said, in mock understanding, Oh, I see. Oh, you must think... Oh, much, Master. You are not a suspect in this murder. No, 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 no. Mr. Sully, I must apologise. Of course. You are not under investigation as to this terrible crime. Rest assured, we have already apprehended our prime suspect. This uh, conversation is merely to examine all angles and to ensure a thorough report. A wave of relief at once came over Sally's face. Oh, of course, I, I understand. Thank the prophet. Ooh. Oh, no, no, no. I am deeply sorry, Marchmaster. I completely understand why you were so worried. What with the blood and the guns, and here I am, sitting and looking you up and down like a lamb to the slaughter. He broke off because he had started laughing. Sully joined in sheepishly, and for a moment the tension in the air abated somewhat. Oh, <laughs> that is a good one, MacIver said, wiping a tear from his eye. No, no, as I said, we have our suspect in custody already. We are simply gathering further evidence for the paperwork. You must understand the nature of my job. My name is Ram Captain McIver, and I am in charge of this investigation. Me and my apprentices will be here staying until this whole affair has been cleared up and the responsible individuals have been, well, executed. Your suspect, Sully asked tentatively, is it... He licked his lips. Well, well it must be. MacIver smiled up at him innocently. Is whom? he asked, and Twiggy could see that his gaze had turned cold. R Rowan? Sully asked, his voice barely above a whisper. MacIver tensed in his chair, but didn't stand. Why don't you have a seat, Marchmaster? He gestured to the opposite pew. The Marchmaster at once sagged into it. I knew it, Sully said, slamming a fat fist into a fat leg. All signs of previous fear disappeared at once. I knew that he'd turn out to be a bad egg. There was always something strange about him. Something unnatural. You can't let a wolf come to your door and be surprised when it turns on you. Prophet, but I knew it! I see. Tell me more about this person, and uh, can you repeat their name for me, please? MacIver opened a new page. He seemed genuinely curious, but Twiglet could tell that he was probing for something. Rowan. Bloody stupid name at that. Can you imagine being named after a tree? Sounds very mist-like to me. Sounded mist-like from the very beginning. As Sully spoke now, the words seemed to spill out of him all at once. Ah, I knew he was trouble from the start. The sage and I have been pushing Cole to have him been put on trial for years. The boy was too useful, though. Cole wanted to keep him around. Ah, oh, bloody deadly when he got to fighting. But it rarely came out of it with more than a scratch. It was damn mysterious to me. He was shifty looking, too. All innocent like and obliging. A fucking puppy out in the open. But I have to say, though, if it were me, I'd have put him down a long time ago. Him and that English fucker as well. God damn, what's his name? English, you say? MacIver interrupted. Hey, Mickey Lou. <sighs> Some drifter turned up before my time in office. Churchman tolerated him, and he got along with the sage all right, but he was a bloody loiterer. 
I wouldn't bet against him being some sort of mistkin too. Perhaps one of their ridiculous heretics. His is another head that I'd like to see on the chopping block by, by prophet I tell ya. Fucking weirdos, the pair of them. They both stank of the mist. Interesting. And where is this Mickey Lou now? I don't know. He doesn't work. He just sort of hangs around, usually in the pub or drifting from place to place. Oh, fucking English bastard. I bet he's turned tail. Probably helped with the killing, I bet. Oh, I never liked him. Something prissy about him. Something well-maintained, if you know what I mean. Ah, Cole was a good man, but he was a damned fool when it came to managing people. How he allowed abnormals like those two to hang around is beyond me. McIver had gone very still, his pen hovering over a clean page in his book. Slowly, he took off his glasses and regarded Sully as he folded them. So, let me be clear. You believe that there has been a mistling living here right under your nose for the last four years, and you have done nothing about it? Well, n no, but it's not my place. Ah, so the church is to blame. I, I didn't say that. Well, then what are you saying? Because the version of events you have currently described to me leave you either as an incompetent fool who allowed the mistling to slip past him under his nose, or as a blasphemer that believes the church is incapable of managing its estates. His voice had slipped to a whisper now, and his great hands were slowly flexing into fists. No, no, it's not like... Sully's earlier eagerness had disappeared, replaced with a quivering fear. It's... the churchman, he, he was the one... He had brought the boy in from somewhere. I, I don't know. Perhaps he had been corrupted or charmed by him from the beginning. There was nothing I could... You dare drag Cole's name into the mud! McIver roared, springing suddenly from his seat, the heavy pew thrown back and thundering to the floor. Sully cringed in his seat, looking a lot like a rather fat toad beneath a hawk. You dare insinuate that your churchman knowingly harboured a misling? That he was a traitor to the prophet and the faith? No, no, I, I... Stolly stammered, his face pale. No? Well, that's what it sounds like to me. Indeed then, Master Sully, tell me how it is. Well, I, I wasn't... I, I wouldn't... I, I didn't mean... MacIver towered over Sully, every muscle taunt, veins popping in his neck. The Marchmaster was struck into silence. His mouth quivering opened and closed as he tried to babble out some excuse. But before he could, MacIver had continued, his voice low and menacing now. I would be very, very careful if I were you, Marchmaster. Because it sounds to me like you are trying to blame the church for your own inadequacies. In situations like this, heads must roll. Responsible parties must be put to death. Truth is of the utmost importance. I will not abide lies to be spread about that might bring into question the church's capabilities. Knowing that, I will ask you one last question. He leant over so he was towering over the cringing man now. Did Churchman Cole have any ties to this Rowan person? The Marchmaster wiped the sweat from his brow and mumbled a very quiet, I, I, I don't understand. Oh, you still don't understand, do you? Because I feel like I am being crystal clear right now. Answer the damn question, Sully. Uh, <clears throat> no, said Sully, fully trembling now. He, he, he didn't have anything to do with Rowan. Ah, very good. And did anyone see or know this mistling before today? Uh, no. Uh, 
He deceived us all. He, he was a wanderer. Turned up not two days ago. MacIver nodded slowly at this and eased back from the Marchmaster. Good, he said calmly, as Sully let out a gasp of relief. MacIver turned to Hobnob and gestured to him close. Keep an eye out for this English boy, and bring him here along with anyone else that you judge is suspicious. We are now officially on clean-up duty, you understand? Oh, and before you do, have the sage sent to me, and get this lump of shit out of my sight. Hobnob grinned and nodded, then grabbed Sully by the arm, dragging the whimpering mess to the door. Twiglet watched him go, her eyebrows knitted in confusion. No, Twiglet, MacIver said, looking at his notebook. Why did I do that? That is the sort of question you should be asking. Well, why did I do that? You need someone to blame, Twiglet said, the realisation hitting her. I... A churchman has been murdered. That is no small thing. It makes the church look weak, makes it look like we cannot look after people or defend them from the mist. When people see the church as weak, their faith wavers. Sometimes you need to make a show of power to keep them pious. Spill a little blood just to keep the uh, morale up. My recommendation is always to take a head or two from important people. The townsfolk will find that more justifying, and they will know fear. But of course, you don't want to execute someone competent or worthwhile. Hence, Sully, Twiglet said, and then followed that to its natural conclusion. Or the sage. Indeed, one or the other, which is why I'm going to meet the sage next. She's already in luck, though. She needs only be a mite more competent than that arse of a man to keep her head on her neck. Twiglet considered that as MacIver finished off the last few notes in his book. He rose with a groan. In the meantime, I want you to ask the locals about this whole thing. See what they know and see if any of them are friends with this Rowan. They may also need to be executed. Then search the grounds and see what you find. I'm going to talk with this sage here and then the suspect. I want you to bring me something I can work with before I'm done. Eh? Good girl. It was dark and Twiglet's boots crunched across the gravel as she headed back towards the church. It had not taken her long to find the pub and the chaos that had greeted her there. Shattered tables and chairs, a door ripped to splinters. For some reason, the Mistling had decided to smash up the local pub after he had charmed the churchman. At least, that was what it seemed at first glance, though a small part of Twiglet's mind was screaming at her that the whole scene looked more like an aftermath of a fight than of wanton vandalism. She searched her knowledge for any odes that talked about this kind of thing, but came up blank. The men she had found outside the bar she had questioned and found them equally confused. They had been searching for the woman who ran the bar, a girl by the name of Maisie. No one knew where she currently was, and after some questioning, Maisie learned that she and the Mistling had some sort of history of some kind. They referred to the Mistling as Rowan, and it was extremely clear that none of them harboured much love for him at all. In fact, they were all too eager to see him as a mist folk. As for the Englishman, there was no sign of him whatsoever, and no one seemed to have anything to go on. It cheered Twiglet to know that there would be unlikely to be any more executions than necessary. With no sign of the bartender, she decided to head back to the church and report her findings. She was just drawing closer to it when she heard the clipped voice of a woman through the open door. She paused before hearing MacIver's reply back. But of course, I thought as much, MacIver was saying slowly. Then the woman's voice came back. I'm not surprised. Frankly, this conversation is a farce. We both know you knew what had to be done from the moment you arrived here. And the English boy? What of him? Oh, please, Mullen. I made the mistake of treating you like a fool. Don't make the same mistake with me. I'm not treating you as a fool, Captain. I meant what I said. I would love to keep him, of course, but... Needs must. From the sound of it, the ram captain must still be interviewing the sage. It was a long conversation. What on earth could they be discussing? 
She wanted to eavesdrop a while longer, but she already knew that she had a short leash on today. Instead, she stepped away from the door and began to survey the grounds around the church. They had been so wrapped up in a rival with what they had found inside the church that they had hardly had a chance to look around the grounds yet. From first glance, they were well kept and looked after. Over on the north side, connected to the back of the church, sat a squat set of stables. A short way beyond that stood a solitary shed, the type of thing that might be a tool or gardening shed. It looked nondescript enough. The stables were empty, but for a tired old pony that regarded her curiously. Still, she gave them a thorough look over before she headed to the shed. As she got close to it, her boot hit something on the ground and sent it skittering through the dirt. Kneeling down, Twiglet saw that it was a chunky padlock, bent out of shape, as if a great deal of force had been applied to it, causing it to shatter. It was curious. She pocketed it and turned to the door, sliding the bolt across and pulling it open. It was dark within the shed, but a line of light pierced into it from the open door. The light illuminated a chair in the centre of the room. It was a large and weighty-looking chair, made of a dark stained wood that seemed to exhibit an immovable quality. There were metal cuffs on the armrests and dark stains on the wooden floor. Twiglet stepped inside, her eyes running over the walls and the terrible things that hung there. She cursed aloud as she took in the jagged knives and tools, the hammers and corkscrews, the sharp things and the blunt things. What kind of place was this? What was going on in this room? And why was it here? The shed was thick with the odour of old sweat and blood. She had smelt that particular combination before, in the Department of Questions, though that had been a long time ago. The Department of Questions, of course, were masters of torturing. What need would a simple churchman have for a torture room? In a town this size, it was almost overkill. The floorboards creaked beneath her boots as she moved further inside, taking in all around her and trying to think of it like an investigating ramguard should. The air was strangely stagnant, like it was holding its breath, and there was another smell beneath the others, a stronger and riper scent. She focused on that, trying to figure out what it was. It reminded her of a time long ago, going on a hike with her mother outside the city. They had stumbled upon a dead sheep, its body tangled in the barbed wire of a fence and left for many days. The water and the rain had melted the flesh from its bones, leaving it as a bizarre totem to decay. She noticed that there was a swinging light in the centre of the room, and she reached out instinctively for the switch. Her fingers found it on the wall and she clicked it, not really expecting anything to happen. This was a shed, far away from the main building. It would be madness to have electricity brought here when the price of that was so high. However, to her dismay, the light flickered on with a low buzz, and Twiglet blinked in confusion. Artificial light at once filled the room, casting shadows across the wall and revealing the floor to be dark and stickly stained in blood. The red stains seemed to run around the chair, down it, and off in a trail behind it, ending in a set of loose floorboards. She stepped behind the chair and saw that the stains were almost in a line, as if the blood had cut off suddenly when it reached this point. Running off a hunch, she pressed her knife blade into the gap and hinged it upwards. There was a satisfying groan as the floorboards came up at once, revealing a trap door and a set of stairs that went into an earthy darkness. The pungent scent was stronger now, and it hit her all at once. There was something down there. Something dead. She pulled off her pack and rummaged inside it until she came out with a wind-up torch. After winding it several times furiously, she descended into the dark. The cold and the smell hit her all at once. If she thought it had been bad before, it was far worse down here. She pulled her coat over her mouth and nose and wound the torch another couple of times, giving a brief burst of light that revealed she was heading into a rough, dug, earthy tunnel. She had to continuously rewind the torch to keep it alight. The damn thing barely lasted a second before its beam began to fade again. She wound it and the beam blossomed to life again, illuminating several things all at once. There was an open space at the bottom of the tunnel, and there were a number of deep holes cut into walls around it some larger than others, but all at least an arm's width across, and dark within. 
Outside each one of them hung a glittering ornament that flashed gold in her torchlight. She stepped towards the closest of them, her torch whirring in her hand once more. The light reflected off the surface of the nearest one and revealed it to be a mask of some sort. Painted gold and with a similar design to the mask of the prophet that marked the crosses of all the believers of the new faith. She reached out and touched it, and as she did, the dying beam of her torch illuminated the inside of the hole beside it. She frowned into the darkness, uncertain of what she had just seen. The torch whirred again as she stepped away from the mask and closer to the hole. She saw the feet first, bare and white. The remaining toes that had not been cut off had red scars where the nails had been ripped free. Then there was the legs and chest, covered with tattered clothing and dark red stains. Her torch shone across the face, or what was left of it. Her breath died in her throat all at once, and she had to clasp her hand over her mouth to prevent herself from screaming. The man had been old, or at least from what she could tell, a farmer or just townsman. There was very little left of him. The corpse had no eyes, nor nose, nor ears. Its mouth was agape, revealing the holes where several teeth had been removed. There was no doubt that this person, whoever they were, had been brutally and mercilessly tortured before being killed. Twiglet stumbled back, her eyes darting from that body to the other holes in the wall. Her breath was coming fast, her heart thudding in her chest like a drum. Unable to stop herself, she found herself inexplicably drawn to one of the smaller holes, her torch whirring a final time. This time, she did scream. As the torch fell from her fingers and clattered onto the ground, as the torch fell from her fingers and clattered to the ground, she turned and ran for the exit, nearly stumbling and falling in the dark as she clambered up the stairs three at a time. Moments later, she staggered into the church, throwing open the doors and almost colliding with a middle-aged woman as she did. The aloof-looking woman must have been the sage, and she did little more than glare at Twiglet as she sidestepped her and made for the door. Twiglet didn't care. She ran straight up to MacIver, who regarded her with mild interest. Yes, Apprentice Twiglet? Bodies, Twiglet stammered, her voice threatening to break at any moment. There's bodies under the shed. Calm down, Twiglet. What did you see? Oh, gods. Oh, prophet's mercy. They're, they're children. <laughs>